Okay, good um, morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. I am Aideen Culhan here at Dana-Farber and I am absolutely delighted to have Dr. Kelly Fox um, today to speak with us. He is a native Hawaiian geneticist and he's a indigenous rights activist and an assistant professor of anthropology at UC San Diego. He advocates for more inclusion and representative genome sequencing to allow indigenous populations to gather and analyze their own geno genetic data and benefit from those um, discoveries. And um, welcome. Um, I believe we should be saying aloha. Yes, aloha. Thank aloha. you for, for, uh, for having me. And I recently learned about the meaning of aloha and it absolutely touched my heart. So please tell everybody else about it. Yeah, sure, sure. So aloha kako, that just means may there be love in this Zoom room. But I think that the word itself is quite dynamic and contextual. So it doesn't just mean hello, like a, a greeting would. Um, you, you've also probably heard it used as goodbye but it's also used as, as a symbol of love, um, affection, and many, many other things. And it's quite ubiquitous throughout Polynesia and the Pacific. So in the Maori cultures, they'll say aroha. Um, we say aloha, obviously, in Hawaii. And- um, That's wonderful. I think that's something, you know, in during the pandemic and everything, I think we can say that we wish aloha to everybody. Um, and I'm really excited about today. I want to, um, I see that we're still having a couple of people join, but I want to mention to people to please feel free to ask questions at any point in time. We really want to hear your questions and um, we would like everybody to benefit from today's conversation. Um, I think you have a couple of slides just to tell us a little bit about yourself and also we'll talk a little bit about why um, you're passionate about this field of research and why we should all be. Yes, yes, indeed. Let me just do my screen sharing and share a few quick slides just to introduce myself. My name is Keolu again. I am originally from Hawaii, my, my mom's family here. You can see Hawaii is one of the most isolated remote places on planet Earth and similar to you, it's an island. And it is located though in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, we're really proud of what we've accomplished as voyaging people. Um, it goes as far as to say, I mean, these islands have literally shaped our genomes. They've shaped our, our history, our understanding of our history our culture, and our susceptibility to disease. Um, if you've ever been here, it is, it is one of the most remarkable places in the world. And I'm not just saying that because I'm from here, but it is one of the most biodiverse places around. Um, we have uh, 10 out of 13 biomes on planet Earth, including snow and rainforests and deserts. We have some of the most diverse soil profiles on planet Earth. And it is also the extinction capital and the invasive species capital. Uh, so that really makes you think dynamically about what the effect of, you know, introducing and visitors and colonialism. And so it's really hard to spend time on the big island and not really deeply think about the effects of natural selection and colonialism and many other things in shaping biological diversity and our susceptibility to disease. Um, here we are cooking, something I love to do. This is in my Ohana Hale, my, my family's home on the big island, and we're making something called Lao Lao. And this, these are taro or kalo leaves, and we're just wrapping them up and then steam cooking them here in uh, this large cauldron. It's like a typical Hawaiian meal. It's delicious and healthy. Um, and where we're from, we say we have many different kind of 
sayings, but one of them is Ikavama Mua Kava Mahope. And this is something that I kind of like channel in a lot of the work that I do. And it's walking backwards into the future. It's this idea that we're keeping our eyes on all of the mistakes we've made so we don't repeat them. And this is like contextual to many things that we do. If you think about all of our research and the scientific questions we ask and the solutions we provide for those, we should be thinking about that. That is to say that ethics is not an afterthought. It's not an auxiliary thing that you add to your projects. It's the seed that you should germinate every single one of your ideas. You should build technologies and innovation from that position. It should not be um, something where you, you perform ethics, you window dress ethics to, to uh, seek authorization to work with communities, for example. It should be more related towards partnerships and building actual collaborations that have impact in communities, health and culture. Um, I started really thinking about uh, interpreting the past and um, many of the different ways that we use data and material culture to understand and repatriate the identities of historically marginalized people. As an archeologist, I, I started as a historical archeologist. That's my roots, my framework for a lot of the ways that we think about things. And I had the pleasure of working as like a young undergrad um, in, in, in the Y House area of, of the, West, the Eastern shore of Maryland. And I worked at a plantation where Frederick Douglass lived as a child and may or may not have taught himself to read and write. This is one of the most important people in the history of the United States of America. And so collecting data there in such a sensitive place and thinking about how we repatriate the identity of historically marginalized communities is really, really important to me. And this really kind of calibrated me at a, at, at a young age, thinking about these really sensitive questions. I then went on to the National Institutes of Health, the Center for Research on Genomics and Global Health through NHGRI, working with Charles Rotimi, who we all know. Um, and I started working on my first entries into kind of computational science and thinking about data as a resource and mining data and how we organize data to you know, think about um, predilection to disease and health disparity. And we worked on this amazing project in Walaita, India or uh, Ethiopia, excuse me, with a postdoc who was then my boss, who's now a, a professor and investigator at NIH and his name's Fasil Tekola. And I watched this project blossom into something extremely successful. I learned about the dynamics of gene environmental interactions and the way that social stigmatization can influence the prevalence of uh, mutational frequencies and really thought about and learned about human genetic variation in these deep dynamic dynamic ways. I also worked with a bunch of scientists that were from historically marginalized communities. So my entry point into genomics, that's the only thing I knew. The only thing I knew was watching an Ethiopian man publish his work in, in the New England Journal of Medicine. So that became normalized and that became possible. And I'm very grateful to all of those people still to this day. Um, I then went on to graduate school at the what I think is the best genome sciences program in the world. No offense, Harvard, Stanford, but UW, we punch way above our weight. All the technology that you're using um, was probably developed there. No, I'm teasing, but uh, but we had a real focus on technology development. Um, this pro this program is the the legacy of Lee Hood and many others that developed all types of computational tools, physical tools, and genome engineering tools. And I got tuned up real quick and I learned about developing um, tools that that kind of enable the, the precision medicine agenda. And specifically, I worked on tools to determine high resolution blood type from next generation sequence data. And one of the things we stumbled on and, and discovered was that there are there are individuals who do not even have large sections of their ABO gene, which for population genetics purposes is the most overstudied gene in population genetics, probably. It's the poster child for human genetic variation. 
uh, was described in depth by Lucas Cavalli Sforza and others. And to find human genetic variation in this gene that had never been seen before because we really focused on minority populations and their health was kind of astonishing. And we found structural variation there and, and published that work. Uh, I also designed algorithms to think about integration and predict ABO blood type from Neanderthal and ancient genomic assemblies and really think about phasing and haplotyping and learning about machine learning before it was cool. And these were a, a lot of the, the benefits of my, my kind of classic coursework there and learning and thinking about like how we create these false narratives, like something that's medically actionable is independent of natural selection. How did those two things become siloed when they're in fact the same thing? Um, now I'm a professor at UCSD. This is perennially ranked the number one surfing institution by Surfer Magazine as a university in the United States. It's a blessing. It's also an epicenter for genomic technology development. Um, we have a, a thriving medical school, thriving indigenous communities, um, a thriving biotech uh, scene and environment and ecosystem with companies that serve the larger genomics community like Illumina. And it's been a lot of fun and I'm just getting started. So uh, finally, I'm Hawaiian first and then a scientist. And in Hawaii, we have been futurists since the dawn of time. We had color newspapers well before anyone in the United States of America. We had electricity in Iolani Palace well before the White House. We had been producing world-class doctors. And even our King Kamehameha had been thinking like a futurist, installing cannons on his voyaging canoe um, in pursuit of unifying the islands. That is to say that we utilize the best technologies available to empower our communities and strengthen our culture. And that's exactly what we're doing at the Indigenous Futures Institute at UCSD. I'm a co-founder of that. And we're exploring and using new technologies and emerging technologies to serve indigenous communities like genome editing, um, artificial intelligence, and many, many, many other technologies. And, um, and it's a lot of fun and we're just getting started. So with that, I will leave it at that and just continue the conversation. Very cool. I actually did my postdoc with Des Higgins and that's he, he came from evolution. He was looking at evolution of beetles in his postdoc and did multiple sequence alignments. So very much, I, I think, when we look at our genome, we can't understand it, but in light of evolution, I, I think it's incredibly important and um, can be so, so valuable to us. And But I think I'd like to spend a couple of minutes um, just to kind of frame the discussion a bit, because we're going to be talking about ethics, about genomics, about disparities, and how we as data scientists and biostatisticians and biomaticians can do better, and what maybe we should be thinking about when we analyze our data or when we help design studies. Um, I think you know, in, in, your 2000, in your 2020 Nature Reviews and Genetics article, you stay in rights, interests and expectations, indigenous perspectives of unrestricted access to genomic data. You state, indigenous experience with genetic re excuse me, research have been shaped by a series of negative interactions. Issues of trust, accountability and equity underpin indigenous critics uh, critiques of genetic research and sharing of genomic data. And that distrust is something that we hear a lot about in with minority communities and indigenous people. And even more so, I think the pandemic at the moment has highlighted issues of distrust. There was a recent article in November in New England Journal of Medicine, where um, it was Reuben Warren et al. And they said, they discussed the troubled history of, of, of um, clinical trials and drug trials where black and brown communities um, and minority communities have had considerable injustice. And as a result, there's a low minority participation rate in clinical trials. Um, and that's important for development um, of future medicines. And whilst 
the black population in America is 13%. They account for over 20% of deaths from COVID-19, but only 3% of people enrolled in the trials were actually from that community. So I think for the for those of us that, you know, ethics and history are not like 101 in a bio biology or medicine degree. And I, and I feel they're so important, they should be. But can we briefly, just for a couple of minutes, maybe highlight a couple of injustices that have happened in the past and maybe where people could find out about that history? Because I think unless we know the history, it's difficult to move forward and to fully realize what needs to be done to repair that history? Great question. I think this is more timely than ever. I mean, with regards to hesitancy in uh, one, you know, this fear factor that's going on with vaccine, you know, deployment right now that's going on in this country with specific communities. So there's a hesitancy to receive the vaccine. And then on the other side of the coin, there's this hesitancy of and fear factor of, will I receive the vaccine? But you understand how important those things are, are related in terms of uh, a number of things that are going on in terms of the deployment of it. If we were to look at the deployment of those that have been vaccinated in this country, like myself, the privilege that I have um, in that sense, we would, we would probably see that there's an overwhelming um, population of people that have received the vaccine versus, ver this would not represent, right, minority populations. Um, but historically, I think it's really important. I had a professor of mine in graduate school, Maynard Olson, and we had this class, the philosophy of genomics. And it's so important to couch, th couch things historically, like the development of technologies. If you don't know about Sanger sequencing, then you probably shouldn't be working with next generation sequence data, for example, right? Like we want to, to people to understand the iterative development and advancement of things so they can appreciate it, especially students. And um, so we have to really, really focus on that in the curriculum we build. But three kind of historic examples to me that really set precedent and sowed the seeds of, 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 of this hesitancy and this very blatant exploitation of historically marginalized people's rights, just specifically with America, are probably these, these key moments. I mean, one, you got to start with the transatlantic slave trade and the, the displacement of indigenous people in America broadly. I'm talking to you from Hawaii. This is a state that was kind of illegally acquired because of a, a, a government overthrow. Not a lot of people come here when they, when they come here and they, they don't know that when they stay in a place like Waikiki, for example, but that's the history. And that sows doubt in the minds of people because less than 1% of people in Hawaii, for example, own land that are Hawaiian. That's a, a huge problem when you, when you think about our access to all kinds of resources and health. So we can just start there with, with that kind of idea. Then there are these like moments of historic injustice that don't help at all. Um, one of them to me really that set precedent for the development of ethics and consent and the Belmont principles is the, the, are the Tuskegee experiments. And if you're not familiar with these, this is when they took a, a population of, of black people, um, African-Americans, and they exposed them to syphilis and kind of let the natural course of syphilis uh, happen without providing them with antibiotics, which is already like a known, a known treatment for this. This is highly problematic and it, and, it, and it sows doubt in the minds of people that are involved in clinical trials because the idea that that could happen again is looming. Um, then there's famously ASU, Arizona State University versus um, the Havasupai community um, in which they engaged the community and told them, you know, we know you guys have really high rates of type two diabetes. We think there might be a genetic component to this. Um, would you be interested in being involved in this large biomedical study where we'll take your blood and, and, and other things. Um, then a member of the tribe was actually attending school at ASU and saw somebody giving a talk about that data, but it was in context of schizophrenia. 
And that's how the community found out that their data was being used for something else that they, they didn't have consent for. This violation of consent led to this huge lawsuit. That lawsuit led to basically a number of ripple effects that happened within indigenous communities in America with the Navajo Nation, the largest federally recognized indigenous community in the United States of America, putting a moratorium on genetic research. So then that causes a sort of domino effect. Other kind of smaller groups follow in suit and that hesitancy is exacerbated. Other examples, we'll head to the islands, we'll head to the Caribbean, Puerto Rico. It's not a state, it's a territory of the United States of America, but famously there were forced sterilization uh, done with all types of women of, of Puerto Rican uh, ancestry. And even today, we have a whole bunch of news articles indicating that there are, is forced sterilization going on at the border in places like uh, the San Diego border in, in, in Mexico. And so we have to reckon with history, but we also have to realize what's going on right now in this country. And so if you come from one of these communities and you know that history, there is a fair amount of distrust in systems. So part of the reason why there's this disparity in and bias in genome sequencing, for example, where we have estimates of around 90% of GWAS studies exclusively feature individuals of Western ancestry. And then we know, and you've elegantly described these problems with what's happening around clinical trials, especially when we're talking about COVID. I mean, it's really important that these clinical trials are designed well and they include the, the least, the last, the looked over and the left out. And um, it's really hard to do that when you've sowed the seeds of distrust. And then we have to find grassroots efforts and educational platforms and you know word of mouth to essentially get the idea across that this is a good thing. This vaccine is working. We have to point people to the data. We have to say, look what we're seeing in Israel right now. Look what we're seeing in Scotland. It's working. The the burden of people in healthcare systems is decreasing. The number of fatalities is decreasing. The new Pfizer report that got leaked yesterday shows that the, in, the infection rates are, increase, or are decreasing. Um, and we have to point people to that empirical information. Yeah. We also, I mean, and I'll just leave it out with this, but we also really need to focus on this misinformation and disinformation campaign stuff. I read recently in Finland, that they have a child show where they have a little bear that talks to them, the babies, about uh, about the news. And they go through the news and they say, oh, that's not real. Or you have educational programs and art classes where you look at video that's fabricated or images that are fabricated and you are able to discern that something's been doctored up, right? We have to educate people and create that literacy and fluency around what fake news, so to speak, is. And then finally, we need to understand like what is a credible news resource. If you're getting your information from YouTube and we're telling you that New England Journal is the place to, to, to acquire information and believe because it's a peer-reviewed resource, you know, how do we really educate people on what that means? Yeah, I, I think education is so, so fundamental. Um, in, in the US where the curriculum is so diverse geograph and geographically determined, um, I, I, I think it, it, it's going to be state by state and it, it's going to be, um, it's going to require a lot of grassroots um, efforts in order to, to, to put that in place. And um, it's an interesting question. I, th I think coming back to ourselves a little bit as what, you know, I think we, we can always do more community outreach and public outreach. And I always think that's important. I engage myself in, in local schools. But um, as data scientists and as statisticians and as professionals that analyze data and design some of these trials, we know that vulnerable populations are both understudied and underconsulted on the use of their data. Um, you've described how effective genetic medicine depends upon the availability 
of reference databases. And you've campaigned that there should be a Hawaiian um, population specific mm -hmm. human genome reference. Um, so can we speak about, I know that we like 90% or, or at least 80 something percent of the genome information that we have is derived from the Caucasian population, mostly of European descent. Um, so we know that there's both distrust in indigenous populations to provide their data, but also without that data, it's a catch-22. We can't develop medicines in order to help those communities, thereby exacerbating their health dispar disparities. So how can we, like on a real practical, like, you know, day-to-day -day basis, how can we try to work to be more inclusive? And what should we be considering when we're both analyzing data or designing studies? And, and is there a couple of like simple tips that we can just keep in our minds that we go, okay, you know what, I need to be cognizant of this when I'm writing my grant or analyzing my data? Yeah, that is, that is such a great question and so important, again, uh, currently and into the future. There are just so many entry points where bias sort of gets baked into the analyses we do or we, we actively attempt to what I would call have data fit a model or have a model fit data. Um, or sometimes we don't even know that we're creating bias. And there are a number of entry points for like easy intervention. Um, one of them is, as you alluded to, is the sort of uh, the reference itself. Like everything we ping off of and compare variation to, we're not really learning as much as we can because the reference that we use is biased. Um, I had a talk with one of my mentors from the University of Washington, Bob Watterson, and you know they were very clear about how the genome reference was created. It's sort of like a patchwork of individuals from Buffalo, New York that they recruited through the newspaper. It worked really well at the time. It does reflect its, its when it was created, 2001. Um, and I think like if we were to do it again, in, in hindsight, it's 2020, what would be the population that you would start with first? I mean, clearly it should be something out of Africa because that's, that, that, those are our origins, right? That speaks to our evolutionary history. That wasn't what happened. And so here we are in 2021, literally two decades later, thinking about all of the ways we've created these forms of bias and who these technologies and these statistical analyses and all the math we've done over those two decades, who does that, who does that privilege? Who are we designing the future of precision medicine for? Okay, so that brings us to this next position. It's, it's how do we improve that and provide new solutions and new avenues for development that speak to the full spectrum of human genetic variation. So let's first start with America. It's a really diverse place. Um, I think we need to really, really focus on creating population specific genome assemblies, high resolution assemblies where we can really focus on not just single nucleotide mutations, but haplotype structure, long reads, um, structural variation, inversions, copy number variants, um, all of these just incredible types of variation that are so undercharacterized. Um, one of my PhD mentors, Evan Eichler, really blew my mind as like a 24 year old when I learned about structural variation and its influence in the genome. We have created this bias in thinking about SNPs or SNVs, whatever you wanna call them these days, uh, and that form of variation because it's more it's more easily detectable in the methods we have uh, via short read genome sequencing and things like this, but we really need to zoom out. So this is why I'm critical of these large scale genome sequencing projects because it's more of the same using more of the same technology rather than, it's like a qual quantity over quality issue. I think we should be building population specific references to serve our communities because that allows us to impute and infer and model in these new and novel ways. Instead of getting stuck in this feedback loop where 
our potential to innovate and discover things is much lower. Um, so we have taken that into consideration in the way that we're designing Polynesian specific genome reference assemblies and panels of variation that speak to the Pacific. But that's just the one thing that we can do. Uh, I, I hope that other people will do the same thing. But, but the things that people are discovering like Evans Group, when they publish that um, Melanesian population specific reference, and they discovered new human genes, let me repeat that, new human genes that had never been characterized previously. Do we understand what that means? These are genes that have functions in the human genome that had never been seen before. And that's in like 2019. So then that begs the question, how many other such human genes are out there? What types of structural variation exists that has not been characterized? How much hidden variability in disease susceptibility and predilection to disease exists because we keep doubling down on the same technology because it privileges investigators who already have that workflow. It's not, it's not disruptive to the status quo. It's not innovation, right? All of the people that support the All of Us program, you know that. You know that this is an irresponsible use of hard earned taxpayers dollars for that reason, because we have technologies that disrupt that apple cart that can lead to totally new avenues for development. And so it's frustrating because we want to serve diversity in the most genuine way possible. And um, I'm advocating for that and I'm building projects in that direction. You basically okay. mentioned the all of us projects there in a Hello? I think it would be the opposite because the All of Us project have stated specifically that they will try to include more diversity in the mm -hmm. genomic sequences that they'll capture. They've right. said that 50% of mm -hmm. um, their genomes will be from minority groups, from black and brown communities and indigenous communities. So that has an enormous potential. Correct. Um, to um, give us so much more genomic information and also enable us to understand diseases in communities and develop better therapeutics. But I think it has to be done ethically and that's something that you've um, raised specific concerns about recently. Um, and you have asked if the projects are actually abiding by the common rule criteria. Mm -hmm. um, could you explain a little bit about your concerns in these projects and how, and, and maybe how that then relates to, you know, trial design and, and stuff that, you know, we're doing day to day and how the concerns there can then impact what we're doing? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's not to say that like, I think we can all agree that generating more sequence data, um, in this case for a million people, is a tremendous asset, right? It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a noble goal. But when we use the same technology that we've been using to create uh, really, you know, these, these depending, on, depending on how things are done. One, we're just, <laughs> major, a lot of the kind of, historically marginalized communities of people that are being included in this project, you know, some of them will be genomes that have already been sequenced before. So that's not new data. We're not discovering anything. And the resolution, again, we're using short read genome sequencing technology from Illumina at all. And so that's, again, problematic because we're not achieving the full resolution um, because we, we didn't go in the direction of creating high resolution population specific long read assemblies, which we could have done, which would have been, I think, a better investment of time, energy and money in terms of imputing and thinking about everything that happens downstream. Um, and then there's this idea about the common rule and the development of this large scale database. Um, and I may not, I don't think I'm the only person that's skeptical about the development of this project. Because again, if it's just we're scaling something up and it's more of the same, I don't understand how that's innovation other than the size of the data set, if that makes sense. And the questions we should be asking are, how much federal funding goes into that? 
and and how could that money have been divvied up or divided up into a number of basic science-based projects that would have had more impact. And I think I'll be right on this in terms of the way this plays out historically. Um, then there's the issue of, of the common rule aspect of this. So for those that aren't familiar, it, the, the idea is that we shouldn't develop things that don't benefit everyone, right? It's kind of a simple idea. Um, but I think there are certain things that happen that are violations of the common rules. So one of them recently happened with Vertex. Vertex designed this new uh, cystic fibrosis drug. They used genetic information that they derived from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Um, they recruited patients directly. They used these new protein domains that they discovered to refine the development of their pharmaceutical product. And then they sold it back to those people for $300,000 a year. So let's dig into that. I don't think that we should live in a country where anyone has to pay $300,000 a year for a drug. I think that's a violation of the common rule because it then becomes inaccessible. It panders towards our broken healthcare system. It panders towards um, broken, corrupt insurance policies. And that's not why I'm in medicine. And I don't think anyone is in medicine for that reason. I think that system has been optimized for profit, not for health. And those are the types of deep questions that we need to ask. Is the all of us program being optimized for profit or for health? I think when you look at the constellations and the setups of how making that data set publicly available, what happens? Is this actually going to lead to the, the development of, of treatments that are going to directly impact people in a country where we know we have a broken healthcare system and we a vast a, a large proportion of people don't even have access to healthcare in the first place? These are the types of real questions that we need to take a hard look in the mirror. Because if investing that much money into this large scale project, into a data set that's going to be publicly available, unrestricted access, and then larger pharmaceutical companies are just going to pick up the data set, harmonize it with their existing data and use it to kind of fast track the development of, of the next generation of cholesterol treatments. I think that's not what the system should be optimized for. The system should be optimized for health and longevity and decreasing infant mortality rates and things like this. But because the system is optimized, for profit, this is what you get. I think those are big questions. Um, so there's two things that come to mind. Of course, having the genome public, I think is fundamental and important because in the early days of the Human Genome Project, if it weren't for people like Sulston the Sanger we may have been in a situation where the genome might have been inaccessible to research. And, and you know, there's certain genetic tests, you know, like availability of BRCA sequencing, you know, mm. have impacted how fast we could um, develop research in, the, in academia. And yet at the same time, we need companies to develop therapeutics. So I think that's good as well. I think... The pricing um, is a situation for governments and higher levels to work out. I'm not too sure how we can do that other than, you know, state that this, this, this is an issue. And, and, and you know, but it is, it, it's, it's having the data allows us to develop the, the, the allows the development of therapeutics and, that is so, so important. But then how those are made back, available back to those communities is, is definitely an ethical consideration that we should be concerned about. So I would like to ask if people would like to ask, I really would like um, people to engage in questions. Please post your questions in the mm -hmm. Q&A and um, I, I will, will post them. So please let me know what questions you have um, and how you can engage in this conversation. Can so there was an interesting um, 
article I read recently, and, and I, you know, your insight might be invaluable and, and we might mm. learn from it. Um, so, and the question was, was when we're trying to engage minority and historically injustice, that's not a word, is it? The communities that have <laughs> suffered injustice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm making up new English words here. Black, brown and indigenous communities. We can't simply say, oh, please be more trusting. Look, here's the science. You know, mm. believe us this time. We know things have happened in the past. Now just please trust us. We need to earn that trust and we need to deserve that trust. Mm. How... One of the things that, the, that you know, I'm interested in, 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 and it's important to us, is how you do informed consent. Yes, and there's exactly. two words there. One is it's informed, and the second is you have consent. Um, and culturally, that might look different to different people. And that's something I think without knowing those cultures, we can truly appreciate. So how do we create consent mechanisms that are respectful to diverse communities and even their cultures? And is there ways that that can be changed? And this is maybe taking your own insights coming from a community with a, a very different cultural perspective to European Caucasians probably. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, about informed consent. Before I get to that, I wanted to just backtrack on something that you said about about like it's it's not our responsibility to you know hold big pharma and policymakers responsible. I would I would argue that that it is and that we have a certain level of agency there and we could have a much larger influence. And so when I see and I'm inspired by um, Eric. Lander, for example, being a direct scientific advisor or Alondra Nelson and their potential impact on the development of these things, it's, 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 there's, a, there's a potential for a lot of change there. So I'm hoping that uh, they're listening. But, um, but, but with regard to informed consent, this is a huge um, important issue because it's like, it's like much like any other technology, informed consent has evolved and human rights if you believe in those, uh, have evolved, right? And they have they have changed and they have recombined and they have sort of assumed and integrated new technologies and they look very different than what informed consent may have looked like when many of the sort of uh, pri primary investigators sitting in 